Okay, so uh, we, are, we are now going to have the uh, industrial panel. Uh, the, the goal of this panel is basically to reflect on what we've seen during the day and to discuss some of the directions and challenges uh, with uh, four experts of the domain. So uh, we are, uh, I'm first going to introduce everyone, uh, starting from uh, uh, the rights. So Aurélien, uh, we have seen Aurélien earlier today. For those who are not around, Aurélien is a researcher. He's working at INRIA in Lille and he's an expert on privacy preserving uh, machine learning. Uh, so he gave a talk about uh, those topics. Then uh, Mev, uh, so Mev uh, Corcoran, I uh, hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, is a managing director at Accent Labs. So uh, she drives the artificial intelligence R&D uh, work and she's, uh, I mean, she focuses on responsible AI on uh, I mean, how to organize uh, the global response AI lead for technology innovation. So one of the topics that you are an expert on is algorith al algorithmic fairness, and we are going to discuss that during uh, this panel. Uh, then uh, Bruno. Uh, Bruno is a CTO and co-founder of Cosmian. Uh, so I mean, Co Cosmian. Uh, aims at applying and uh, expanding the, the use of uh, encryption, so what was described in the second talk of the afternoon. And the goal is to, I mean, basically enable uh, companies to use, uh, I mean, to leverage encryption, encryption techniques in, the, in machine learning. And uh, finally, Victor. Uh, so Victor works uh, in the same company as uh, um, Mathieu, who just presented. Uh, so uh, in Okin, you are heads of commercial operations, and basically you are responsible for the commercial development of Okin, uh, federated learning platform for medical application. And so I would first like to thank all uh, our speakers uh, for being present today and for participating in, pan in this panel. And just for those who don't know me, I'm Emric Durve, and I'm just assistant professor at Polytechnic, so, so that I don't remain uh, anonymous. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I mean, we just have one hour, and I hope we have time for questions of the audience at the end, but uh, I would like first to, I mean, basically we are going to try to organize the discussions in three main parts. We would like first to discuss about federated learning uh, at large, I mean, and all the things we have seen today. Uh, then we would like to talk about uh, I mean, privacy because I mean, many of our panelists are experts on the, the privacy topic. And finally, we would like to go beyond uh, what we have discussed, possibly discuss about fairness and ethics and other things that possibly are not at the heart of federated learning but are still extremely important on many aspects. So, uh, I, I mean, I would like to thank to Mathieu and Leticia that gave us a perfect introduction to uh, what, I mean, the challenges of federated learning and obviously all the speakers. And I would like to start by a very simple question, perhaps, to uh, Victor and Mev about the use cases that you have and the challenges that are the most possibly important or hardest to tackle. Uh, Mathieu just presented that. There is privacy constraints. There is engaging people. There is uh, scale issues, etc. What are the, the most important aspects in some of the cases, perhaps you have just described one example and, and describe what the challenges are. So you have a mic here. Okay, <laughs> i go first. Is, that, is it on? Yeah. Um, so I suppose in terms of um, sort of the use case at the moment where we're seeing the most potential, I think a lot in the healthcare and life science space, and that was sort of evident today with, with a lot of the examples in the research was were around that space. Um, also, some limited some examples in, say, financial services where where the federated learning happens within the same country, say, across country borders. Um, so they're sort of the the main space in terms of where where the key constraints are at the moment. I think from a technical side of of, of things, there is obviously the side of privacy and security. So again, a lot of the research we saw was in that space. Also, you know, unbalanced data sets, and then also the whole side of communication. So they're all sort of being tackled by researchers at the moment, which is great. I think from a business side of, of things then, in terms of big constraints, what we're seeing is things like, um, well, the key one that I've seen and where I've worked with, with clients is actually on the liability side. So there's a lot of talk today about um, privacy guarantees, but as soon as you start talking to a company about 
privacy guarantees. They say, oh, great, you're, you're guaranteeing privacy. Therefore, if there's any data breach, you know, you'll be liable for it. And we're like, oh, no. And then they say, well, then it's not a privacy guarantee. So I think that actually, that is a really key element, especially when there's personal data involved um, from a business point of view. Um, and then the other thing from a business point of view is value, you know, proving out value. So there's a lot of theoretical value out there and the, over the last number of years, and there's loads of money going into startups, you know, uh, to get to value, but there isn't that many examples yet of proved value. And I think the more of those that we have, the, the easier it will be to get business along. Thanks. So I'm, I'm not necessarily going to repeat all the challenges that Mathieu, uh, you know, very well uh, highlighted, uh, but perhaps taking on an example of some of the applications of federated learning at Alkin. So in the Melody Consortium where we have 10 competitors who are working together uh, using very, very sensitive and private data. And then on the health chain side where we have uh, two hospitals collaborating with Alkin on very sensitive, but in this case, you know, personally identifiable data. One of the common challenges that we see across all federated learning projects is the first of all that each one of them is very unique and so the partners that come together to put together a federated learning project have their own perception of risk, have their own perception of, of what they want to protect and therefore where they want to focus all of their efforts in terms of protecting the privacy of their data, the confidentiality of the data, the model. And so it's a real discussion and it's a real uh, uh, kind of tailoring every time of setting up a network for these partners. And I would say the other challenge, and again, on top of what Matthew said and data heterogeneity and privacy, is one of leadership. And by that I mean that a lot of these consortia are formed because one person or two institutions who, who you know, know each other and work together, you know, really take the leadership on forming that consortium and say, we're going to be using these technologies, we're going to be setting up a federated learning consortium, and therefore we need to take some of that responsibility. And that leadership actually carries a lot of effort because you have to convince other people. And so if you, again, if you think about the Melody Consortium, you have here 10 experts in drug discovery coming together, uh, led originally by uh, somebody at Janssen and Novartis, really pulling this, this, this group of peers together and saying, we're going to try something that's very cutting edge, that's transformative. And everybody kind of needs to take a leap of faith. And to do that, everybody needs to follow you know, somebody's leadership. And I think that's the other you know, difficult and, and hidden angle of, of a lot of these federated learning projects today is that it requires the corralling of a group of people and that means then convincing legal departments, and so imagine convincing 10 pharmaceutical companies' legal departments to share some of their most sensitive data, and in fact, they're not sharing it, but you know, to register it into the network. Again, that requires leadership internally and, and some champions internally at those companies. And same thing if you think about health chain and the hospitals, you need the professors to take on that champion role internally at the hospital and convince the IT departments and the legal departments that yes, we're gonna participate in this, and to really tackle each roadblock as they come along, because it's an educational challenge for all of these departments. So I think that, that there's been a lot of technical challenges highlighted, but there's also a big you know, people component to this that we need to acknowledge and, and work through. Yeah. So thank you very much. This is very interesting. And on, on that point, on the how, how to engage people to participate in the, in the federated learning process. So in your experiments, do people come to you with I mean, asking how it can be done, or do you have to convince people? And if you have to convince people, what are the best ways to do so? Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, who, uh, I mean, perhaps uh, Bruno, in your experiment, perhaps? Well, we, we usually don't go to people, they come to us. Uh, uh, it's already hard enough to convince people to do stuff with brand new technology. Uh, so if you start evangelizing uh, those technologies, you just make it much harder uh, for adoption. So uh, we usually, what we really like is to tackle challenges uh, where there is no other solution. So we are not a substitute to something that works or more or less works, but uh, where there is no other solution than enabling technologies such as uh, differential privacy or cryptography to be able to tackle the issue. Um, if, you're, if you don't do this, uh, immediately people will start to compare, you know, uh, wh what happens if I do this in clear text or uh, in the normal way compared to your way. And obviously doing differential privacy has a cost. Uh, you, you add noise. Uh, you're doing cryptography, you, you have a cost performance or ciphertext size. Uh, 
so there is a cost of doing this. So I think at the moment, uh, what the market is ripe for is really projects where there is no other solution. Uh, really, you have you, you you're not a substitute to something that exists, but uh, you enable these t kind of technologies where that's the only way to 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 move forward. And finding these use cases is not that easy, actually. Okay, that, that's very interesting. Uh, so does someone else want to react on that? How to engage uh, people, perhaps? Uh yeah, maybe j just a quick word. I think again, we're working with often uh, perhaps uh, you know early technology adopters, but there's still a massive learning curve, and so uh, pilot projects and and you know getting uh, simple examples through the door and getting people familiar with the technology is a great way to obviously get that adoption going, um, and that can come from either you know people coming. Uh, to you with the problem that it have identified or sometimes you know for people who are very knowledgeable about the industry and and again uh, at Aoken we have very specific knowledge around you know histopathology in in the case of oncology coming to companies and saying hey we 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 have identified this problem and we think this this technology can help you is that is that a problem that you you feel acutely and then you start building a relationship with your clients and you start to to look at applying that technology um but but I think the the other side also is to try and make sure to that your customers, the people on the other side, are understanding what they get out of this. So, in the case of uh, in the case of Melody, for example, each pharmaceutical partner that participates in this network walks away with a model that is unique to them. So, it's a setup that we uh, commonly kind of label vertical, vertically partitioned federated learning, where each participant comes to the game with their own uh, data, but everybody walks away also with a model that is unique to them. It's been trained and it's seen, you know, common data and it's and it's seen, you know, the data from the nine others, but it's something that, that belongs to them. So you're not compromising intellectual property for, for them. You're not leveling the playing field and saying everybody's going to now use the same drug discovery model. But it's now something that everybody retains in a unique setting. So the key in kind of overcoming, I think, some of these objections and overcoming and getting people engaged is really detailing, you know, what's going to be in it for them to participate in a game where others might benefit from their data or the hard work that they've put in over all these years. Thank you. Uh, Aurélien, do you want to, to say a word on that? Or? Maybe more, more of a comment uh, is that also sometimes you get uh, surprises maybe in what convinces people in a particular use case. So I'm also working uh, a bit in a project with, uh, for federated with hospitals. And so maybe you guys have working, uh, had a similar experience, but for example, one of the arguments that convinced the physicians the best was the fact that uh, it's potentially much, much lighter to update a study when you get a little bit more data than you were, because currently the, the processes that they have for centralized, for doing these multi-centric studies across different hospitals are very, very heavy. And so they are not going to go through that again if they have, you know, a bit more data. And so they were kind of quite uh, convinced by this argument, w which was obviously not the one that we had, you know, come up, come up first to try to, to, to convince them. So, yeah, it's important to understand the, the needs, I guess, in, in, in each of these uh, use cases. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I think another point uh, we, we could mention is I think there are many researchers in the room. So who is doing research in the room? Just to, to double check. Uh, yeah, that's about half of the people. And I'd like to ask to people in industry. So there is clearly today kind of a gap between what we are doing in research and what happens in industry. Because uh, I mean, we are sometimes tackling problems that are perhaps a bit uh, too advanced or not necessarily corresponding to the challenges that you face in practice in order to, I mean, have the methods in place and just engage people. And I would like to ask to people in industry what they think the biggest challenge is yet for us in research. So what are the directions in which we do not have yet a, a, a proper answer and what are the directions we should tackle? And I'm going to ask the question first to people in industry and then perhaps to Aurélien what he thinks the most, the biggest challenges are for us in, in the next few years. So, yeah, I don't know uh, who wants to react, perhaps Mev, if you yeah, want. Um, I think in terms of, uh, and we saw it here today, I think in terms of academia, it's really important that there's a mix of projects in academia, some that are tackling the really hard problems that will take more than a year to tackle, that might take the length of a PhD to tackle, but then also that there, there, there's sort of some of it that is actually staying closer to industry and looking to see, okay, with what's actually there now or applying something over here, can you actually solve a problem for industry 
in in the next six 12 months so i think but it, it was really good to see today there was a really nice mix of projects as well here in terms of some were actually direct collaborations of industry where they were trying to solve an industry problem and then others were a little bit deeper and going going further along so i think that that's really important from an industry point of view and from a research point of view that there's a balance there um like I'd, harping back to the privacy thing i think that's an area where i don't think academic research on its own is going to solve it for you know in terms of what i was talking about liability and stuff but actually the the more we can solve because interesting when we were talking earlier you were saying oh there's all these different avenues that we can still explore like for industry they need all of those to be closed down <laughs> and to be clear so there's still a good bit to do there um so i think that's one of the areas where if 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 academia can keep going and then industry looks for other interesting ways to maybe help solve it like i think was it you were saying earlier maybe it's a new area for insurance like they could decide to insure the risk of data breach when different for federated learning is used so but they need they'll need a confidence as well so i think it'll be a balance between industry and uh, academia to solve some of the problems yeah. I just wanted to say researchers are doing a great job. Uh, they are actually going faster than the industry. Um, and uh, when you look at advances in cryptography, I think Pascal has, uh, has been giving you FHE, but FHE is not the only cryptographic uh, mechanism out there. There is MPC, there is FE, there are, there are many, and they are all ex moving extremely fast. Uh, same thing on the differential privacy, privacy, differential privacy side, sorry. Um, what What's really uh, missing today, I think, for mass adoption is that we, we're not talking about adding privacy, but that it becomes privacy by default, not by design, but by default. So uh, when you get a piece of software uh, in your company, you don't have to worry about what sort of encryption it is using or whether there is differential privacy in there. It must just be in there. And we are clearly not at this stage today. So um, I think the next, uh, to me, the next challenge is, is really how uh, we can bring these technologies to something which is usable and injectable, become a ground technology that becomes part of any software design, basically, that we do. So a standard developer, when he enables a database or an application server, doesn't have to worry about whether cryptography is in there or not. It's in there. It just works. Uh, he wants to do an anamorphic addition, fine, it's in there. It just has to call uh, something and it's, it's just in there. Uh, we are not there yet. So I think a lot of research has to go into, and Pascal was mentioning on this, on, and you know, normalizing things, uh, making things available. Uh, so it, it takes a little bit of time, but researchers are doing a great job. They are moving extremely fast on all these fronts. Um, maybe from, from my perspective, and maybe there's a more of a commercial one, but it's to say, to create more consortia and to have more international collaborations and to have, especially in the medical field, to have more researchers say, actually, I want to collaborate with so-and-so from this institute and I want to combine our data and so I want, to, I want to see what we can do by joining our data sets. Create more use cases for federated learning and for the types of encryption technologies that are being developed so that it's going to drive and continue to drive then the need to actually develop and, and, and deploy those technologies. So more kind of on the application side, continue to, to drive those applications. All of these IMI consortia are fantastic, these EU consortia are fantastic because they're really driving driving that, but they don't necessarily need to happen under these massive frameworks. They can also happen between just two researchers who, who, who really appreciate working together, but one is based in, in France, the other one is based in Japan, and they just cannot combine their data. Well, here we have a use case, so more of those. Aurelien, so oh, to, to ask the question, Aurelien, what's the, the direction you are the most excited about and one challenge that you think is completely locked for the moment or something that is big to unlock? Yeah, so, so of course this is kind of difficult to look ahead uh, in this field because uh, it's a very active one, but uh, maybe things connected to research, but also I think which have can have a very important impact in practice. Uh, I think one of these things is to kind of generalize the idea of federated learning to encompass essentially data science, the, the, the whole data science uh, pipeline, which, okay, machine learning is one component when you do data science, but you also need to do other things. Uh, first, you need to uh, do data exploration, okay, and then when you train, you need to tune hyperparameters, and there's many things that you need to do, and I guess looking ahead, uh, it would be very nice to be able to do this whole pipeline without having access to the data, right? And so kind of adapting the tools, adapting the algorithms to make them usable in this fashion. Uh, for normal data scientists, 
so to speak, that have n don't have specific expertise, maybe in fidelity learning, to be able to use those, those tools. And then when you add privacy on top of that, there is something that is very important and I think needs a lot more work, is automatic privacy accounting. So this is the idea that, you know, there is someone that wants to compute things on the data and it's typically a sequence of operations that are adaptive. So when you do data science, you first, you know, look at the data or get information about the data and then based on that, you choose the next thing to do and so on, right? And we need to be able, if we have privacy guarantees, for example, differential privacy guarantees, to be able to tightly keep track of that budget. And so I think there is still a lot to do there. We have like the basic principles of that, like this composition idea, right, from differential privacy uh, addresses that to some extent, but it's often quite loose and there are many ways that when you know a bit more about the operations that you are doing, that you can optimize this process. And so I think this also will have a lot of impact. Um, and then maybe one last thing, uh, which is dear to my heart, is kind of also bringing these tools to kind of the citizen level. So right now, the big promoters of federal learning are, in the end, mostly maybe remains Google, who even invented the thing. And so this is great, right? This is probably an improvement uh, that Google can do whatever it's doing without really having the data locally. But in the end, mm, normal people do not really have access to the fact of training these models and getting this insight and so on. And so I think there are nice challenges also for software, hardware, so that citizens can actually get in control and decide also for themselves, okay, let's all you know, go and compute this thing or learn a model to do that. Uh, and yes, empower people in, in, in this way. So I think that's a very exciting uh, challenge. We have a lot of work yeah. to do. <laughs> okay. And we need, we need politics also. Yeah. <laughs> so who wants to do politics here? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so I think that the privacy point is, is one point that uh, somehow binds all of you together. So uh, we have seen a couple of very interesting presentations. You talked a lot about DP and a bit of encryption. Uh, uh, Pascal obviously talked about encryption. I think that's something that uh, we, I mean, can be used together. I would first like to ask to Victor and Bruno, how, which technologies you use? Perhaps, Bruno, you can give a bit of, uh, I mean, some elements on what exactly your company does first. Okay, yeah, we, uh, as Cosmian, we actually uh, build enterprise software, so something that can be used in IT, in large companies, that includes uh, encryption techniques, uh, precisely when you want to protect data or protect a model or you want to uh, give privacy to the users behind the data. So we are bringing really the advanced encryption techniques and diff some differential privacy too as well now into uh, enterprise software. Uh, because we think this is the only way to make it mainstream is that IT people can just get the software is that inside. So that's what we do. That's our mission is to bring this research into IT software. Um, now, um, today the scope is very wide. Um, so you have, uh, I would say, clear text techniques like differential privacy uh, that uh, uh, that adds noise, for instance, to uh, to clear text, to let's say more cryptographic techniques. And cryptographic techniques, you have many, uh, even homomorphic cryptographic techniques. There are many. We've seen FHE, which is uh, probably one of the most exciting, actually, from for, for the mathematicians, it definitely is. It's a fantastic toolbox. But there is there are other techniques like uh, multi-party computation. Uh, functional encryption, in which uh, the lab here at uh, ENS is probably one of the most advanced in the world. Uh, there are even hardware techniques like uh, secure enclaves, uh, TEs, uh, uh, notably Intel SGX or AMD uh, SEV. So basically, you have processors comes with secrets inside the processors, um, and all these techniques have different security parameters uh, when you look at it. Uh, they can have formal security parameters like in FHC, so we can do math and prove that what we do is correct. Uh, they can be just, they just work, uh, like uh, some symmetric systems, or, uh, well, you hope they work like uh, trusted enclaves and nobody can break them because they are subject to side channel attacks. Uh, so you have different security parameters, and also these techniques usually have different impact on your data and the performance. Um, FHE will tend to be less performance sometimes with other techniques in terms of CPU uh, and will tend to uh, have a higher uh, expansion, a bigger expansion of clear text data to the size of ciphertext. Ciphertext will tend to be big. Uh, other techniques like MPC don't have this, however, they have a lot of communication rounds. So depending on your setting usually, uh, who you work with, what you want to achieve, 
uh, usually as is, is the main factor in choosing which technology you're going to enable. Do you want performance? Can you have good communication between partners or not? Do you need to minimize interactions? Uh, all these uh, aspects, uh, what sort of calculations you want to run. Uh, if we want to do linear operations, functional encryption is super efficient. Um, so uh, usually the external factors is, is what is going to drive the sort of technologies you're going to use. And uh, sometimes we do a combination of technologies actually. So there is no good single response to what should I do to protect privacy technically. Uh, it will really depend on your setting and the sort of computation that you will want to achieve. Thank you very much. And uh, Victor, so perhaps yeah, can I you... I think you've actually said it all. It's, it's that it's extremely custom and it's extremely uh, dependent on the setting and the parameters that you're trying to optimize for. Um, and in the case of, for example, Melody, actually, they're, they're using, you know, secure aggregation as a way to, to, to protect the model updates and, and minimize the risk of inference attacks on any single server. But, but that technique may not be the right one for a company who wants to train their model on, you know, medical images from different centers. And so, again, we have to adapt to the individual needs of, of, the, of the consortia of the network. Okay. Um, yeah. Perhaps on, on the Aurelien uh, and a point on how to combine uh, possibly both approach? Yes, so, uh, so of course these techniques can address different privacy or security problems, but they can also be combined to provide maybe better solutions or different trade-offs for a given problem. So for instance, uh, some of the work that I presented, the first part is a case where uh, allowing to use secure channels, which is essentially based on public key inscription most of the time, allows you to improve the privacy UTG trade-off of differential privacy. Uh, conversely, there is a whole line of work where uh, people want to use MPC, so multi-party secure computation, uh, but sometimes that is expensive and so you can relax a bit the model and say, okay, I'm not going to reveal only the output, but maybe I will reveal a bit of intermediate results, but I will protect them with GP. And in this way, you leak a bit more than pure MPC, but you can hope to improve a lot the uh, computational efficiency, for instance. So there are a lot of things like that. This is true also for enclaves, so like you mentioned, enclaves, they have these site channel leakage sometimes, maybe if you observe communication or if you observe memory accesses, you can, this leaks information and GP, for instance, in some cases can be used to mitigate these leakages. And so, yes, I think the value lies uh, in most cases in also combining these solutions. Yeah, no, no, just to agree, yeah, what okay. we're seeing is usually, it, it, Occasionally it's one, but usually it's, it's more than one, uh, one of the techniques that's applied for use cases. Sure. And uh, I mean, following on that, uh, perhaps a kind of a provocative question, I mean, do you believe that we have a, bet, a good enough understanding to just, I mean, really push for those methods and to, I mean, develop them and really ask people to trust everything that we do? Or, I mean, when we see DP, we know that, I mean, there is a lot of a huge high importance on the parameters we've heard or at least I've heard that I mean the way the I mean the industry choose those parameters is not always satisfying uh, I mean we are advertising for a technique I mean we are uh, communicating to the public and pushing for these kind of techniques uh, do we believe that we have I mean enough just like good enough understanding of those techniques or shall we be a bit careful on that Go ahead. Uh, um, I, I think, uh, <laughs> like I think, and it was mentioned, y you were saying about how it's hard to find the right use case at the moment. I think there are use cases today with what we know today and what we're confident about today, where you can get to value in the use cases. So I think for me, there's sort of two parallel streams. It's, it's working with industry to find those use cases and get them implemented and get to value, because also you learn a lot as you get to value, even in small use cases, um, and then in parallel, keep improving through research, and then hopefully in a few years' time, they'll meet together and, and it'll be possible for federated learning for a scale for, for everyone and for the, for the common user as well. Then. Okay, and, and perhaps... Uh, I mean, at some point, do you believe that companies like Accent or Okin will be able to assume the liability to, I mean, somehow guarantee that there is no loss of privacy and not rely on some, I mean, I think you mentioned earlier that perhaps one day there would be insurance to ensure the loss of, uh, of, of privacy. Uh, but, I mean, if we really believe in the technique, when are we going to be able to, I mean, just guarantee it without relying on some external party? But I think the thing is, the risk is, never going to be zero you, you know realistically it's never going to be zero so i think it's much more likely to bring in a third party that's 
that actually their business is to ensure a risk that you can't guarantee, that, you know, that someone like Accenture can't guarantee against. So I think that's probably the more likely way to resolve this in the, in the shorter term. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, do you know if there, I mean, does anyone know if there exists such uh, a project to ensure the loss of privacy? Okay, anyone in the room? I mean, so you can also react if at some point someone. No, you, the, the usual way is uh, you go through certification at some stage. So basically, uh, you have standard practices. So uh, first, I want to say uh, industry behave is a bit, it's a bit, you know, a bit like sheep. So I have to. If one does it and it works, all the other guys are going to do it. So usually, in one single industry, you know who is the. Uh, the the early adopter, you know, you know, among banks, you know, these banks usually are the guys who try stuff, you know, uh, uh, like a bit like uh, Israel with COVID, you know, you, you, usually you can single out per industry the guys who actually try the new stuff, so everybody's watching them, and if it works for them, the other guys do it. Now, in terms of, uh, so, and, and we need we need these use cases, we need these successes, and that's what we are looking for right, right now, I think, for all these techniques, uh, just to make them mainstream. Uh, then what's really going to make mainstream and solve, I think, a lot of the legal issues, also the legal frameworks are new, uh, GDPR is new, so <laughs> and we understood from the presentation it's not exactly clear-cut uh, exactly what you can do or not do, um, unless I guess you get a lawyer or, or multiple lawyers, but uh, it's not exactly clear-cut, so uh, a way of solving this is through certification. So you will have organisms like NIST uh, for cryptography, I'm talking my, my, my shop, but uh, uh, it exists everywhere, uh, like NIST or ANSI in France, uh, who are going to start certifying uh, technical things, uh, certifying certain crypto. Now, uh, clearly they lag usually very much what we can do in research. So uh, today we are doing homomorphic encryption with quantum resistant uh, you know, paradigms, uh, encryption systems, and they are still looking at elliptic curve right now certification. So that's where we are. So uh, NIST is at the moment, uh, starting to certify the first quantum resistant cryptographic uh, primitives, but only for a very specific case, which is to use in HTTPS for the TLS connection. So, you know, certification takes a lot of time, but it will come. Uh, uh, it's moving forward. And once you have certification, then I think the legal aspects will sort of solve by themselves, because as a company, you will be able to say, well, look, I use the certified stuff and I can prove uh, I can prove by the logs that I did things correctly, and then, then liability will become less of an issue or more a common issue. Okay, uh, and uh, go ahead. Uh, maybe on the point of, of uh, you know certifying or underwriting the risk. So, uh, well, Oaken's business is not to you know is not to underwrite any risks to develop these software. But there, there are all I believe that there will always be people who are willing to you know to to, to get paid a premium to uh, take on some of the risk. But in the case of Federated Learning, clearly these companies, whether they're insurance companies or kind of a new generation of insurance companies, are going to have to be very technically minded. They're going to have to be able to dive into the technical detail of your solution and, and test them most likely. Um, and so that's going to require some, uh, well, a massive learning curve for these companies and, and a huge expertise internally that we're all fighting for because we all want those experts internally to our companies. So I think that's also going to take quite some time before the, the industry is ready to kind of underwrite that risk. And so until then, each participant in these federated learning networks have to accept some level of risk, have to accept some level of, of liability. And, and today, most companies anyway who, well, all companies should have insurance and they all have insurance on, on you know, to protect them on GDPR breaches and stuff like that as well. So there is already a framework by which companies can kind of feel some kind of, okay, we have uh, de-risked this and we have sort of insured this to some extent. But when you're then setting up a federated learning network, if there is somebody ready to underwrite that and kind of underwrite it as part of their commercial value proposition, I think we're not quite there yet in terms of where the technical kind of knowledge of the industry is at to be able to provide that kind of service. But I think it'd be a very, very interesting and promising future once, once they're there. Yeah, thank you. And uh, regarding the, the, I mean, how to set the uh, DP parameters, perhaps Aurélien, do you know how it's done in practice? Do you have examples or anyone working with DP? How do you choose basically those parameters? Yeah, so this is a, a, a tough question. So, and maybe I have a bad example of that. Uh -huh. um, but first of all, okay. So, so in relation to to this, maybe for trust, you you need also some kind of transparency uh, about this because, of course, for different privacy, at least, saying we protect. Uh, data or whatever with differential privacy doesn't really mean anything, right? I can take epsilon equal 
10,000, and then probably, you know, this is definitely private, but with parameters that are not protecting anything. Um, so some level of transparency, I think, is needed there when it's possible that the code itself is available. This is best. So of course, it's not always possible, especially in the business scenarios. But at least being kind of transparent about the, maybe the parameters that are used is important. And so, uh, for example, a bad example of that was a system that Apple deployed uh, at some point, right, uh, where they deployed differential privacy without really being very clear how they implemented it, what was the budget, and, and so on. And so some researchers reverse engineer their, their, their system uh, in a pretty smart way. And so they showed that the budget was above 10 for Epsilon, I think, and they were also resetting it every day for any given user. So, so basically, right, so, so this is more like probably privacy washing than, than, than privacy. Okay, um, it remains a tough question though in practice for a given use case, uh, I think, what parameters are you know, uh, the good choice to get some privacy protection, but also not ruin completely the, the utility. But there has been some, quite some works now f for the past maybe couple of years on evaluating this, I think, uh, with attacks like these membership inference attacks and, and so on. So I think there is a lot of progress ma made there, which gives some way to kind of try to translate for a given use case. So it's hard to generalize across use cases, but at least there are empirical ways to evaluate a bit you know, translate an epsilon, for instance, of different privacy into a concrete kind of protection in terms of uh, data reconstruction or member membership inference and, and so on. But this, yes, this is a tough, tough question in general, I think. <laughs> I mean, I've actually, we had an example where we, we were actually, it was around synthetic data generation, but again, it was to show that it was, it was different enough from the CE data, which is the real data, to be able to leave the organization. So we were looking at privacy. And actually, so it was setting the parameters, but then as well for the, 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 the client, it was showing them, okay, for this parameter, because they had the same question, how do I even know if that's a good parameter? And we explained the maths, and, and they got it, it was data scientists, but um, then it was, okay, we've set this boundary just above this boundary. So the ones that we're saying are not private enough, so we're going to delete them out of the data set. We'll show you the top 50 of those and so, like pairs, you know, here's one of them and here's what's most cl close to it. And they could look at it with their business experience and say, okay, yeah, there's no way you're going to, like, that's very different to that. You can't. Or, no, no, they're too close. And then you say, okay, well, the value then is wrong. You know, we need to make it more private. So, so being able to have some method for the, for the end user to visually see what it means rather than just a mathematical formula is really important as well. Sorry, maybe just to, to give also another concrete example. So I mentioned in the talk that the US Census started implementing differential privacy. So US Census is like the equivalent of INSEE in France, right? So in the US, they publish statistics. And so they have now implemented differential privacy. So they don't release exact statistics anymore. And to do that, of course, they, they had to face this problem. Okay, how do I set epsilon for this and these statistics? And the way they did that is really by doing these empirical studies on historical data. So, okay, they are the US census, so they've been releasing data in the clear <laughs> for a long time. And, and so it was kind of, in their case, not easy, but at least they had the data to you know, evaluate on, on past data what parameters may make sense. And there is a lawsuit, actually, right now in the US. <laughs> People complaining that uh, this is ruin, uh, ruining the statistics and so on. Uh, so this is a quite interesting uh, lawsuit to, to follow. So the think. lawsuit is complaining that they added too much privacy or too yeah, much they, noise. They, they are saying that uh, this, this is all not necessary, that the attacks that people show are kind of unrealistic and stuff. And, and I think the arguments are mostly flawed, uh, at least from a scientific point of view. So yes, this thing is ongoing and a lot of GP experts have kind of entered also a bit the debate. So it's quite, quite uh, yeah, uh, I think quite interesting <laughs> to follow. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other reaction on that? So uh, otherwise, I mean, uh, I think there is another point that was uh, the, the topic of many questions today is data valuation and how do you share the profits? I think it's, it, it's clear that has been a very complicated question, but just you, you were presenting the pharmaceutical example. How do you at least ensure that one of the participants is just not, I mean, participating without any data? And how do you, did you deal with the fact that, I mean, someone could just be here to gain a model without bringing anything to the table? Yeah, so a really interesting question, and I think there are multiple layers to it. 
Um, there's a technical layer, so you, you can implement you know, technical safeguards to check if somebody submitted the same data over and over and over again, and so you're, having, you know, you're just optimizing millions of times on the same task. Or you can also perhaps say, okay, well, uh, we, we have a model that's also seen public data, and so can we, can we check whether or not the participant has uploaded public data instead of their own private one? So there are technical solutions, but if there are technical solutions, there will always be technical people who outsmart you. And so then there is also a people layer. So you, of course you've got the contractual layer, but you've got a people layer. And I think that's important to, to consider is that, again, if you have a consortium like Melody, or if you have a consortium where 10 peers who are you know, industry leads in their field come together and work together in a collaborative but competitive, so a competitive environment, you have a kind of, well, you have a game that's set up, right? And, and so you have a, a system in which you want everybody to be playing the game, and if one person is not playing the game, how does that impact their relationship with the nine other players in an industry where, A, every, you know, everybody kind of knows each other, and, and, and B, your, your career and your name is at stake as well. So I think there is that kind of people layer that's not to be underestimated and you can lean on that and ensure that every participant plays the game in a way that's fair uh, that's fair uh, of course for all the other participants but also that they you, you know that they've got something to lose if they don't play the game and so we can show also that they've got something to lose if they don't play the game technically that they're not going to benefit as much but you can also show that they've got perhaps something else and bigger to lose if they're not playing the game as a, as a participant in this network of 10 people. So that's why, and again, you know, this might be very particular to the types of federated learning consortia that we build at Aukin, but again, for me, it's, it, you've, you're, really, you're bringing people together. So we're not talking about a federated learning consortium of you know, 10 million devices and, and it's completely anonymous. We're, we're bringing together five hospitals or seven pharmaceutical companies or three hospitals and two companies. And so there are individual project leads at each of these institutions that come together. And that adds this layer, which I think, you know, for me, can really be used to safeguard and to, and to help ensure that everybody plays the game in a way that benefits uh, them and benefits the whole consortium. And just to follow up on that, uh, so at the end of the, you said that each uh, company got its own model. So was I mean the model just somehow personalized, or was the quality of the model, um, I mean, depending on how much they brought, or I mean, did I mean did, was that even a question you considered? Yeah, so th there's a lot of information you can you can get on on the website, which is melody.edu, uh, um, and melody spelled with two Ds. So, but but there are a couple of different things here. So it's quite a unique environment because because everybody brings to the game their own components, and nobody uh, ahead of the time agrees on what data they're going to bring. So you you saw uh, the graph that kind of Mathieu showed about compounds and assays. There's no coordination between the partners ahead of time that we're going to bring these compounds and we're going to bring these assays, and therefore we're going to optimize for these tasks. So you're kind of ev the, the model goes in, you know, effectively blind, and and so it has to be prepared to learn on any combination of compounds and molecules. So if you think about a, a picnic, for example, everybody comes to the picnic with their own food and nobody coordinates whether you know uh, this person is bringing starters and just cucumbers and this person is bringing just you know starters as well and everybody just ends up s eating starters or if, if, you, if you've actually got a complete meal whereas in, in the case of health chain if we take the picnic analogy again we've optimized already ahead of time and we know what we're bringing to the table so we know that everybody's going to be eating the same kind of complete meal at the end of the day and so the way that it's been set up in melody is that okay so you've got this first layer of complexity where you don't know kind of what people are bringing to the table and the second uh, split has been done that you've got a common trunk model that is that is what's been kind of trained on every data that's uh, been registered and then there's the optimization tasks that happen on each individual server on each individual's data so they so they're walking away with a model that's unique to theirs, that's been optimized to their data, but that has seen and that has been trained on a common set of, of uh, registered data. And so again, from that perspective, you're enabling people to come, again, to use a picnic analogy, to the picnic with whatever they decide to bring, but also to walk away with their own choice of what they've decided to eat and effectively you know, walk away with their, their, their own um, full stomach, if you will. Whereas in the health chain project, where everybody's walking away having eaten the same thing and having you know, brought and coordinated uh, decide what they would bring. So the, the analogy is a bit stretched, but I think it helps to exemplify kind of the two different setups uh, that you can have. And so the first one is vertically partitioned, and the second one would be called uh, horizontally partitioned, yeah. Thank you very much. So <laughs> can I ask yeah. one more question? So on the, on the melody one, so is it that there was a central model 
trained that trunk model and then it was just re-optimized then locally for each client, is it? Is that sort of where you'd like to say it? Yeah, I, well, I think I, at this point I'd, I'd probably refer back to the website where they go into the more detail about this, this splitting of how the trunk, uh, the common trunk works and then how the optimization happens on the individual, uh, on the individual servers. But yeah, it's some kind of flavor of that, but, but the level of technical detail that's, uh, that, that you need is more uh, eloquently and, and better put on the website than I can explain here today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think another point I would like to, to have a look at is uh, the, the questions that perhaps we didn't really talk about today, which are ethics, biases, fairness. I think uh, Martin, at least this morning, mentioned the fact that it's very difficult to distinguish some adversary that would like to pollute the data set with some kind of, let's say, racial bias or, um, I mean, data that would influence the algorithm in order for it to learn, I mean, bad things from, I mean, a small community that will have a diverging opinion and that you would like to take into account, or, I mean, some other part of the distribution that you haven't seen before. It's, it's very difficult for that. I think it's, it's somehow related to what we do, I mean, this kind of aspect of personalization and, I mean, how distribution and heterogeneity affects the algorithms, but there are, I mean, much bigger questions about what's the impact of our algorithms on uh, the public and society. So, Mev, perhaps, if you could just, I mean, summarize some of the challenges that I mean, you face in terms of fairness and ethics and what the solutions are. I mean, can, can you say a word on that? Um, yeah, so I guess in, in general, fairness, as I think Jan said earlier, is like, it's ambiguous, you know, it's a contested topic. So fairness can mean different things to different people and different companies. So that's one of the reasons why it's, it's, it's so difficult. And so, and also there's very little legislation out there. So it's up to organizations themselves to determine what they think is fair and implement that. So that, I mean, that is a lot of the complexity of it. So you have to decide what's your definition of fairness, then how you're going to quantitatively measure that, how much you're, you're happy for, for it to diverge from, from the, you know, be unbalanced, what you do about it, and, and all of that takes time and organizations from quite senior people and a multidisciplinary group. So that's one of the reasons it's taken a long time. And like I'm actually working at the moment with, on a project with the Monetary Authority of Singapore that's looking to define a methodology for fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency for financial services. And like the questions that you keep, with, and it's with a consortium of F FS companies, and you, the question that you're getting is, okay, just give us the rule. <laughs> you know, what is it? Because that's what they want. They just want, if you tell us what the rules are, we can optimize those rules. Whereas it's, it's not, at the moment, it's not as easy as that because there isn't regulation. So I think that's what makes it complicated. I think the interesting thing about this morning and fairness from, from a federated learning point of view is a lot of the discussions around fairness was talking about fairness for the participants in, like the clients in federated learning, rather than traditionally fairness is about um, the individuals that the eventual model is applied to. So I think in terms of the first one, what was discussed this morning, the participants, to, to your point, have a choice. They can participate or not. So that's going to be naturally solved because they won't participate if it's not fair for them. So that's something, and, and you can see in the research, a number of the people, piece of research today were tackling exactly that question. I think the other definition of fairness in terms of being fair to the end, the people who the model is going to be applied to is one that's very easy to miss because oftentimes they don't, they don't have a choice. You know, it's just applied for them. So that's the aspect of fairness that I think probably wasn't really touched on today and probably would be an interesting place to research because there's a lot of, there's a lot of aspects because you can't see the data. It's hard to do when, when a model centrally trained, the, you check the accuracy on the central model with your data set in a traditional federated learning setup. Usually there isn't a central data set, so it would have to be checked for fairness individually at the client, and each client could have a different definition of fairness for themselves, you know, so it gets very complicated. So um, I think there's a lot of challenges there from fairness point of view. Yes, uh, and do you think, uh, I mean, any of you do you think that there is there are some conflicts or overlap between fairness and privacy, and uh, perhaps Oria? Uh, yeah, so I can speak to the uh, maybe more uh, fundamental as aspects of this question because there is some some recent research on it. So, so maybe at the high level, if you take fairness to be 
kind of you want the model to be to have the same kind of performance maybe for subgroups or maybe for the different participants in the variety learning scenario you can see how they can be tensioned with privacy and f because privacy probably wants that nobody has too much in influence on the result and maybe fairness for fairness to be achieved you might need to kind of give more weight in a way to minorities or people that kind of diverge from the mean or something like that so there is potentially a tension there are some impossibility results like formal impossibility results between some notions of fairness and differential privacy but they are very very restricted and so I think this is still very open question so people have seen in practice some differentially private algorithm like DP SGD uh, harm fairness uh, so e even the model is potentially without privacy already unfair but if you add privacy then it becomes even more unfair but we know also that if you use different algorithms that also satisfy differential privacy this uh, effect might be lower so so in my opinion this is not settled whether there is really an incompat formal incompatibility or trade-off there between privacy and fairness and of course it depends also a lot how you define those uh, tho tho those things but from a research point of view, it's uh, quite an open question. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, any, any comments on that, perhaps? So I think we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I think five minutes left, if I'm correct. Uh, and I would like to take questions from the audience, if there are some. I cannot. <laughs> Whilst the audience thinks of a great question, uh, just to maybe add on fairness, I like the idea that with federated learning, especially to what you were saying, maybe about fairness to uh, the the end user or the end beneficiary of the inference of the algorithms, that that federated learning actually kind of pushes towards a more fair uh, setup because you're now kind of saying, okay, well, you know, if every algorithm, let's say, that you wanted to use in a medical setting had to be trained using federated learning, you're now forcing an instance in which multiple hospitals have to contribute data and so I, in theory you'd be increasing the heterogeneity of your of your data you'd be training on a more diverse population and now of course if you're only picking hospitals from very affluent areas you, you might not be very uh, fair from that perspective but if you could start to say okay well we need federated learning algorithms that that are trained on a minimum of five different hospitals and and these hospitals need to be in such and such geographies so it needs to be one in an urban setting one in a rural setting you can start to say, okay, well, we're, we're looking for algorithms that have seen that diverse data and perhaps create a world in which you have these algorithms that are more um, th th that are more fair to the end beneficiary because they've seen a more diverse set of data. And, and also, it, it will increase the robustness of your algorithms. You're, you're not overfitting for one particular population. So I think it's it's a better way to go. It's fair for the end beneficiary, and it's, and it's also uh, you know, better for the algorithm itself. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, if... I think it's, it's a great way to end the day because it somehow matches some of the ideas that Marco presented this morning in the first talk, trying to reduce violence by sampling in each cluster of data when there is heterogeneity. So we have, I think, closed the loop. And I would like to thank all uh, the participants uh, of uh, the panel again. And uh, also to thank perhaps all the speakers of the day. Uh, I think we are, so we're going to finish this panel right now. Perhaps is there a concluding word, Mathieu? Or otherwise, I think we, we can just thank again all the speakers of today's sessions uh, for, for the great talks we had. Obviously, all the participants too, both on-site and online, and, and all the sponsors, uh, so especially Accenture and Okin and the SFDS and Sky that made possible this event. And I think now we can move uh, to the cocktail that is happening in the Zamansky Tower, and uh, we can have a good view there for people on-site. <laughs>